Bailey and Henderson. So, uh, first of all, you, you uh, wanted to be heard about, go, go ahead, t tell me what you, say it again. Your Honor, so I, we spoke to Andrew Directly's attorneys over the lunch hour. We plan on bringing him out for rebuttal. Our rebuttal on our side will take about 20 minutes. It's a very limited area, as the court's aware, due to the stipulation. Mr. Durst is now alleging that he was given the script. We will be asking Mr. Jarecki, in essence, um, did you give him a script? And when he says he didn't, why didn't you give him a script? What the defense attorneys, I'm sorry, what his civil attorneys are wondering is, what is the scope of cross going to be on rebuttal? And they have requested, the court remembers, they had a motion in limine all ready to go when he was going to testify. They are asking me, um, and I said I would ask you, they will also contact the court, whether they can schedule a hearing by Zoom or by phone so that they are, the lawyers are not having to fly out here on that at one issue, just regarding the scope of what cross-examination. Any objection to them appearing telephonically? No. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll schedule that. Second point. Um, I am in touch with Ms. Joint uh, from the sheriff, representing the Sheriff's Department. Mr. Durst has a medical appointment on September 2. I inquired how essential that was. It, it could be delayed until the 9th. The second would be better, but I, I see no reason to interrupt it. That it should happen on the second when okay. they intend to do it. So that means we'll be in session on the 30th, 31st. And first, we're dark the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. <clears throat> we're going to be uh, dark for the Jewish holiday on the seventh. We'll return on the eighth and ninth. We'll have a two day week. Then it looks like we'll return on 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th. I can't be here on Yom Kippur. Right? When is Yom Kippur? Kippur? Uh, Yom Kippur. Pardon me. 16th. <clears throat> when at sundown? It starts at sundown on the should start at sundown on the fifteenth, and I have to fast, so I'm done. Yeah, I'm I'm not available on the sixteenth, right? Dave, what day of the week's the sixteenth? Thursday. Thursday. Oh, we didn't get lucky. One more day, it could have been a Friday. Seems like we ought to be in argument by then. Should have been an argument last week. Yeah, I know. It depends. We'll, we'll see how this uh, goes. We'll see how this goes. <clears throat> but uh, Mr. Lewin, you think you'll uh, you're crossing the rest of the week? You think? There's, Your Honor, I, I believe that I will likely, in looking at it and in figuring where I'm going, my goal is to be finished on Tuesday. Because if the court, as the court's aware, what I've had to do is I have to go in as I'm crossing Mr. Durst. There's a new question, a new lie that comes up. And again, these are material issues that I'm covering. I'm not covering things like, how many years was your wife in medical school? You know, what car did you have? I'm covering significant issues. Today, Your Honor, as the court's aware, because of the questioning, Mr. No, Durham, I, I, don't, I don't need okay. to hear anymore. I don't need to hear anymore. Okay. It, 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 it's longer than I'd like, but uh, you're surprisingly productive with okay, this thank matter. You, Your Honor. So on, uh, on how long do you expect redirect will take, Mr. DeGarren? A half a day. How long will re rebuttal take? 20 rebuttal, minutes? You, mean, you mean the recross? No, first, no, I'm sorry, redirect, right, so recross and, and then redirect. Recross? Well, well I'll, I'll, I'll allow it, but of course uh, it's a funnel. It's uh, it's limited by uh, what's going to happen during the half day of redirect. I mean, your honor, it doesn't mean it's shorter, it just means that its issues are limited. I, I'm trying to figure out. Um, very hard for me to comment about recross when I don't know what the redirect is. I mean, 
Right. right. We don't know. Okay, but your uh, but your rebuttal you expect is 20 minutes from one witness and less from another. Well, we so right now, here's where we stand. We certainly have Mr. Jarecki. We are potentially going to have something from Lenox Hill Hospital. I don't know if I'll end up getting it, what we'll have, or whether we'll be able to have a stipulation. There's a third witness that I do not want to disclose yet okay. that would be rebuttal, and we'll see, even if I have to call that person, on the issue that I'm going to be calling them on, it's uh, 20 minutes to a half an hour, then it depends on what the court would allow on, on recross. Those are the witnesses right now. The other issue is Mr. DeGaran mentioned yesterday or the day before, maybe it was yesterday, that they're now thinking about calling an expert on Asperger's. I don't have any discovery on that. Uh, Mr. DeGaran just mentioned it, so um, we don't have any discovery. Uh, uh, if the court can inquire, Your Honor, can I be excused for a minute? You're excused. If the court can inquire, Mr. DeGaran, what the status is there, because we have no discovery, obviously. So I don't know why you were telling me you'd be done at uh, in August, well, it's just that probably I'm not the only person who made, made plans. That's all right. Okay, I'm just putting it out there. Uh, clarification yes. on the 26th. Are we stopping early on the 26th? Next uh, two days from now. Uh, four o'clock. Four o'clock. So slightly. And on the 31st, I have it. We're stopping at 3:45. Two forty five. Okay. Two forty five. Your Honor, could the court inquire regarding the issue with the Asperger's expert? We don't have any discovery and Mr. DeGaran just mentioned it for the first time. Mr. DeGaran, I is that your intention to call a uh, to attempt to call a witness on Asperger's? As soon as we uh, make that decision, I will tell Mr. Lewin. Thank you. And did you say 2.30 on the 31st? 2.45. 2.45. Your Honor, we would ask for, if they're debating on a decision, I would assume that means that somebody has already provided information. We're going to ask due to the late discovery at this point in time that the court order the defense to turn over any information on that witness and then if they don't call him, it's kind of no harm. But if they do, we need to be able to have time to figure out what he's going to testify to and how we're going to impeach him. Not sure it's relevant. Uh, that, that, that's another issue, Your Honor. I mean, we don't have, we have no objection. Uh, if they want to call him, we're ready to cross him. When you get discovery. When I get discovery, correct. Well, the obligation is triggered by law when the decision is made. I think, though, Your Honor, the court does have the authority, particularly in a situation like this, to order that discovery is turned over. The court can also have an ex parte and order per 1054-7. The court can order the defense to turn over whatever they provided to this expert, whatever this expert has provided to the court, and then the court can make the determination as to what we get and when we get it. It's very, very late. That's true. Take that under consider consideration. Thank you, Your Honor. Can I resume my seat? Yes. have returned. I've been 
have more information about our schedule. So, uh, this week, the only difference, well, we know that uh, we'll be leaving at 4 p.m. on Thursday. We're getting out a little early. Can't hear you. Then. Can't hear you, Judge. I'm see 4 p.m. on Thursday. We will we'll leave. We'll stop a little early. We'll be in session on Monday all day. Tuesday we will uh, we'll stop at 2:45. Wednesday we'll be in session September 1st. September 2nd. We will not be in session. And we will be uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, of course, although I'll be thinking about it. But Monday uh, is the Labor Day holiday, September 6th. September 7th is a Jewish holiday. We will not be in session on that day. We'll be here on the 8th. In the ninth only two days during that week. The following week, I believe we will still be in session. 13, 14, 15, 16, we'll see. We'll see. I'll leave it at that for now. Wait, no, we're dark on the 16th. We'll go through the 15th. The 16th also is a Jewish holiday. We'll not be in session on September 16th, but we'll definitely be here 13th, 14th, 15th. And we'll, then we'll see after that. Yes? It's the 16th of 16th is dark for the Jewish holiday. Even if we're in delivery? Even, yes. Yes. It's an interesting question. What if we're in deliberations? Hmm. All right. Well, we'll 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 see. I, I I expect that we can't be in session on that day for the Jewish holiday. All right. Very good. Then, Mr. Lewin, you Thank may you resume your cross examination of the defendant, Mr. Durst. Mr. Durst, I wanted to go back for a moment to the sailboat that you had. There was an incident, do you recall, before Kathy disappeared, where your sailboat got loose or got lost for a period of time. Do you remember that incident? No. Did you end up painting your sailboat with your phone number in green paint? I don't remember the color of the paint, but we did paint the phone number on the sailboat. And, and that was done when? I really don't know. When you say, who painted the uh, phone number on the boat? I don't remember which of us did it. And what was the point of putting the phone number on the boat? So that if somebody found our sailboat, they could call us and tell us. Right. And this was done reasonably close to the time you bought the house, meaning it was done in the mid-70s. Is that correct? Bought the house in 1976, and it came with a sailboat. Right. And you painted the phone number on the sailboat around that time, correct? Correct. Are you aware, Mr. Durst, you previously testified that the sailboat that you sold to Bill Mayer that he still has today was the second sailboat that you bought. You mentioned that detail yesterday. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. The sailboat that came with the house was in mediocre shape. And after four or five years, 
it was rotting away. That's why I had the kids come and take it to the dump. About the same time, I bought a new sailboat. Well, are you aware, Mr. Durst, that the sailboat that you have said that you painted with your number is the same sailboat that Bill Mayer still has today? Different sailboat. So you're sa different sailboat. So you're saying, Mr. Durst, that the sailboat that has the phone number painted on it now that Mr. Mayer has, that's a different boat? It's a different boat. But I think we painted the, sail, the phone number on both of them. I think they advised everybody to put their phone numbers on their boats. I also painted a phone number on our canoe. So, Mr. Durst, you would agree that in telling this story, once you committed a moment ago to having put the phone number on the boat soon after you bought the house, you realized while you were testifying that, uh-oh, I need to now say I painted the number on the new boat because you realized Bill Mayer has that boat with the number on it, correct? Object to the form of the question. Uh, Any comment? Well, it was part of the question. Over Everything you just said is wrong. Um, everything I just said is wrong. Everything. Okay, let, let's let's go through them. So, is it wrong that you painted the number on the boat prior to Kathy disappearing? No, that's not wrong. Okay, well, so, is it wrong that you ended up eventually selling a sailboat to your neighbor, Bill Mayer? No, what I was referring to, you're saying I'm making this up as I go along. And I am not making it up as I go along. This is what I remember happening. I just want to ask you, Mr. Durst, have you perjured yourself at all during your testimony in this trial since you took the witness stand? No. About anything at all? No. Have you been completely honest with this jury to the best of your memory? Yeah. All right, let's go to the area. I was asking you about your time in, in Galveston. I want to go back to the time when you were at the boarding house. Would you agree that Morris Black eventually found out your true identity? I disagree with the description boarding house. The, the old house was broken up into three apartments. It was not a boarding house. Okay, I'll refer to it as an apartment. Would you agree that shortly after you got the apartment, you stopped pretending with Morris Black that you were Dorothy Siner, correct? Correct. And he eventually found out your true identity, correct? He found out my name. Well, did he find out anything about your situation involving your missing wife? I have no idea. Isn't it true that nearly every day you and Morris Black would go to the library and you would read the news? I went to the library most days. He went some days. We did not go together. You would agree that Morris Black was someone who was very interested in the news, correct? Morris Black was very interested in the news, I guess. Well, didn't you say, Mr. Durst, that the way you originally met him was you were watching one of your financial programs and he came to watch it with you, correct? Correct. And would you also agree, Mr. Durst, that you told Morris Black that you were basically hiding in Galveston because you did not want to be Robert Durst anymore, correct? Correct. And you told him that that was your name, correct? Correct. And you ended up telling him that you were wealthy, correct? I think he figured out I was wealthy. 
and in the conversation we had when I talked about traveling first class. And n not, not on the Greyhound. First class, right? First class. Y you had mentioned before that you took a lot of Greyhound trips. I said I've taken several. Right, but first class, you wanted to be clear, you meant first class on a plane, not like preferred first class seating on the bus, right? I don't think the Greyhound bus has first class. And you would agree, Mr. Durst, that Morris Black was a curious person? Was he curious? Yes. I don't think I would call him a curious person. Mr. Durst, wouldn't you say that Morris Black was somebody who was very into figuring out what somebody's kind of story was, who they were, what was motivating them. You don't think that describes Morris Black? No. And you said that as far as you know, you never mentioned anything about the situation with your missing wife, correct? Correct. Mr. Durst, do you remember the other day during direct examination mentioning, this is a paraphrase, you told Morris Black all about Janine Pirro? Do you remember when you said that? No. Are you denying that you said it? You're saying during my direct testimony, I said that I told Morris Black about Janine Pirro? And let me be clear, as I say it right now, either in your direct or early on in your cross-examination, you said that you told Morris Black about Janine Pirro. Do you recall? testifying to that? No. I want you to assume for a moment, Mr. Durst, that in fact you did testify to that. One moment. Do we have that key wrap and ready to go on that one? Okay. All right. <laughs> you asked me to get a few clips and they can't. Um, so, Mr. Durst, I want you to assume for a moment that you in fact testified, and I'll get the clip for you before I'm done that you testified that you told Morris Black about Janine Pirro. I want you to assume that you testified to that. If that was true, Mr. Durst, that means that you told Morris Black about your situation that Janine Pirro was trying to use your missing wife to advance her political career, correct? Oh. Well, when was the first time he saw you as Bob Durst? But when was the first time he saw you as Bob Durst? And not as Dorothy Sinus. So I'm in Marsha All right. Did he make any remarks about that? I told him that I sometimes wore disguise as a woman because I just did not want to be me. And he said he went through that a while ago. In other words, not wanting to be you, not wanting to be Bob Durst, did you explain to him why you didn't want to be Bob Durst? Primarily because of Janine Pirro. Well, you said it, correct, Mr. Durst? I said it. Well, so that means, Mr. Durst, that Morris Black was well aware who you were, what you were running from, and that you were very concerned about being charged in New York with your wife's murder, correct? Okay. No, not correct. That's, that that no. doesn't. Please explain, Mr. Durst, if you told Sorry, I have him. I an objection. Yes? That misstates the evidence that was just on the screen. Overruled. Please explain, Mr. Durst, since you just said in response to your lawyer's question, not mine, to your lawyer's question, that you explained all about Janine Pirro. What did that mean? That, that misstates the, the evidence that was just on the screen. Object oh, to the form of the question. 
Mr. Garrett. Didn't say anything about all about. It's the evidence and the inferences one can draw from the evidence that make a question appropriate. Your objection is overruled. I don't remember. I don't think it would have been possible to explain to Morris Black about a Westchester district attorney charging me with murder in order to get publicity to run for attorney general. Morris Black was just not like that. Well, Mr. Durst, all it would have taken for you to explain it are the words you just said. Would you agree? But he was not like that. Mr. Durst, you testified under oath that you told Morris Black about Janine Pirro. What did you tell him? I don't remember telling him about Janine Pirro. Well, you remember telling about Janine Pirro last week with Mr. DeGarren, correct? Correct. Isn't it true, Mr. Durst, that you are dead caught in a giant lie right now and you have no idea what to say? Object to the, the form of the question. No, 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 and no. The objection's overruled. The so, answer may stand. So, Mr. Durst, can you explain why it was that only a few days ago you were able to very confidently answer with Mr. DeGarren that you told Morris Black all about Janine Pirro, and now when I ask you what did you tell him, you can't answer one word about it. Why is that? I do not think I testified with Dick DeGarren that I told Morris Black all about Janine Pirro. I told Dick DeGarren that I had told Morris Black about Janine Pirro. All right, so please explain then what you told him about Janine Pirro. I didn't tell him anything about Janine Pirro. Mr. Durst, you testified under oath, we just played it for you, that you told, please play the clip again. When was the first time he saw you as Bob Durst? And not as Dorothy Sinus? Sometime in March or April. All right. Did he make any remarks about that? I told him that I sometimes wore a disguise as a woman because I just did not want to be me. And he said he went through that a while ago. In other words, not wanting to be you, not wanting to be Bob Durst, did you explain to him why you didn't want to be Bob Durst? Primarily because you need Pirro. So Mr. Durst, can you tell me if you were explaining to Morris Black that you didn't want to be Bob Durst primarily because of Janine Pirro, what that could possibly mean other than the situation involving your missing wife who you were suspected of murdering? It could have been anything. Morris Black did not know who Janine Pirro was. Again, Mr. Durst, please listen to my question. You have said that you explained to Morris Black why you did not want to be Robert Durst anymore. Is that correct? Correct. And you said when asked 
did you tell him why? And your response was, primarily because of Janine Pirro. That's what you said, correct? Correct. Please explain that answer to Mr. DeGuerin, which took place within the last week. Do you want me to explain it to Dick DeGuerin? Is that what you really think I just asked you? Please explain that answer to Dick DeGuerin, which took place within the last week. Yes, Mr. Durst, please explain the answer you gave to Dick DeGuerin. Not right now, please explain it to Mr. DeGuerin. Are you stalling for time right now? Is that what this is about? I'm just stalling comment, for Your time. Honor. I'm in jail. Overruled. He asked the witness if he's stalling for time. The witnesses. Mr. Durst, isn't it true that you That's realize well, right now. Excuse me, Your Honor. What was the answer? I, I, I couldn't hear it either. I was uh, explaining why I overruled the objection and the defendant was answering. He said no was the answer. No, I'd like to have it read back. Yeah, I didn't hear it. Will you please read it back to me also? I'm not stalling for time. I'm in jail. Okay, thank you. Mr. Durst, isn't it true that you're sitting there right now and your heart's racing and you're trying to figure out how you can get out of a big, giant mess up. No. So yes. please Excuse explain. Me. Excuse me. Yes. I object to the form of the question. It's argument. Ah, overruled. Please explain, Mr. Durst, what you meant by primarily because of Janine Pirro. That's what I said. I, we know that's what you said. You said that you explained to Morris Black that it was primarily because of Janine Pirro. What did you tell him about Janine Pirro? I don't think he has. I don't think I told him anything. So is it your version, Mr. Durst, that you told Morris Black that you were dressing as a woman because you didn't want to be Robert Durst anymore and that you then told him it was primarily because of Janine Pirro, but you didn't explain who Janine Pirro was, and he didn't ask who Janine Pirro was. Is that your testimony? Correct. Does that make sense to you, Mr. Durst? Let me finish my question. Does that make sense to you, Mr. Durst, in the way that people have conversations, that you would give that response and that Morris Black would not ask you the question, well, who's Janine Pirro? Does that make sense to you? It makes sense to me, and it is what happened. Let me ask you, Mr. Durst, let's assume you're lying right now. Let's, let's assume, assume I'm telling the truth right now. Well, that can, be, that can be a hypothetical the defense gives you. That's not my hypothetical. Let's assume you're lying right now. I would, think it's your heart that's racing, not mine. Would you tell the jury? Would you tell the jury? Would you admit to the jury right now Yes, I told Morris Black all about Janine Pirro, who he she was. Tell him all about Janine Pirro. He didn't ask who Janine Pirro was. Listen to my question. Let's assume, Mr. Durst, that you're lying about that. That in fact you did explain to Morris Black who Janine Pirro was. Would you tell this jury that? Proper question. If I am lying question. about whatever he said I'm lying about, I would tell you but I am not lying about whatever it is he's talking about. Now, you said before, Mr. Durst, in response to the questions when I asked you, how is a jury supposed to know when you're lying and when you're telling the truth? Your prior response was, I don't know. So my question is, given your current statement, can you explain how the jury is to evaluate whether the last statement you just said is true or not? Well, I think I told you that. I understand there's no courses given for jurors. So jurors have to fly by night on their own intuition to decide how to be a juror. All right, let me move on. You agree that Morris Black, once you mentioned the name Janine Pirro, 
and Morris Black knowing your name, Robert Durst, that Morris Black was certainly in a position to very quickly go on the internet if he wanted to and find out your whole story, correct? Correct. And it's your statement under oath that Morris never did that and never talked to you about it, is that correct? My statement under oath is I have no idea if he ever did that. So you agree that Morris Black very well might have known who you were and what you were running from, correct? Correct. All right. Would you agree, Mr. Durst, that Morris Black was the one person in Galveston who could connect your name, Robert Durst, with where you were living at the apartment? I would disagree with that. Who else? Two bankers who I dated. Who were they? Two tellers from Bank of America who I quote unquote dated. Who you dated? Did you say dated, D A T? Dated, dated, yes. Went to dinner. Two different tellers? Two different tellers. Wait, was this a date with the two tellers and yours is separate dates. No, these were two separate dates with two separate tellers at two different restaurants. Who were these tellers? Who were they? Were their names? Yeah, what are their names? One was Jessica something or other, and the other was Barbara Noose, N-U-S. And have you ever mentioned either of these women? Oh, this has never come up. So, it's your testimony that these women knew who you were and where you were living. Knew my name and knew where I was living. And when you say they knew where you were living, weren't you giving out an address in Dallas as an example and another address in Houston as an example? I gave an example. They visited. We went to my apartment. When you took, when they went to your apartment, were they dating Dorothy Siner or were they dating Bob Durst? They were dating Bob Durst. And, and when did this occur? When was this? I'm thinking about it. Are you thinking about it or are you making it up? I am thinking about it. Okay, go ahead. We'll wait. So this would have been in March or April of two thousand no of two thousand and one. And if we go to March and April in two thousand one, will it mention in the BD story how these were two people who could connect you and your name to Galveston? Well, they were tellers. I met them when I was drew money from my Bank America account. Well, they were more than tellers. You were apparently dating them and having them over, correct? I don't know what you mean they were more than tellers. They were tellers. That's what their job was. So, Mr. Durst, would you agree a teller is somebody that you go to the bank and deal with, correct? Correct. A date is someone you go out with, correct? Correct. If there is a teller that you also take on a date, would you agree they would be more than just a teller? I would not have, have the faintest idea what you're saying. What I'm saying, Mr. Durst, is that these are not just people you're running into in the bank. You're saying you're dating these women, correct? Yes, I took two went to dinner once with each of two women. And I'm asking you, are these women noted in the BD story? I have no idea. Do you want me to run through the BD story, Mr. Durst, or are you going to agree that their names I do not show up in the BD? I don't care what you do. So I'm going to ask you, because it's up to you. We can spend the time flipping through the whole BD story, or you can agree that their names are not in the BD story. Which is it? 
you're supposed to be prosecuting me. I'm not supposed to prosecute myself. And I will repeat again what I said. I don't care what you do. So here's my question. Do you agree, Mr. Durst, that their names are not in the BD story? I have no idea. So I want you to assume for a moment, Mr. Durst, that their names are not in the BD story. I want you to assume that. Can you explain why, if you were dating these women, they're not listed? They know who you are. Why aren't they in the BD story? I don't know if their names are listed, and if their names are not listed, I don't know why they're not listed. You would agree, Mr. Durst, that even if you're saying the two tellers that you dated, by the way, did you have sexual relationships with these tellers? Mm -hmm. what? Yeah. What? Who's that? that was, I was throwing my voice. Ah, yeah. of course. Yeah. 352. 352. Oh, real. Did you have sex with either of these women? No. How many dates did you go on with them? One. And were the dates how far apart? A month. That's and I said March or April. Which one did you date first? Jessica. You don't remember Jessica's last name? No. So, what was the date? What was your name? I said. No, what was the date? You took her out, you brought her back to your very small apartment? She picked me up in her car at my apartment. And we went out to dinner. Where'd you go? A, a crab place. And afterwards you came back to your apartment? No. Did she come inside your apartment? When she picked me up, she came inside. And it's, it's your statement under oath that these two dates happened, is that correct? All right. All right. Let's let's move on. You would agree that whether or not you dated these two women at all, that Morris Black was one of then the three people, other than these two women, who not only knew your name, but knew where you were living in Galveston. Correct. Correct. And would you agree, Mr. Durst, that you were exerting a whole lot of effort? to not connect the name Bob Durst with the place where you were living. Is that correct? With my apartment in Galveston? Yes. Correct. You, I don't know if, if the jury heard that because you kind of um, tailed off. Can you answer that again, please? It was very low. Your, your voice kind of uh, carried off. Can you just repeat your answer? trying to remember what the question was. What was the question? The question was that at that time in Galveston, you were making considerable efforts to make sure that your name, Robert Durst, was not in any way associated with the apartment where you were living on Avenue K. I had gradually stopped making any efforts whatsoever. That's why I was withdrawing money from Bank of America. Obviously, when I went to Bank of America to withdraw money, I had to show them a government picture ID with my name on it. Did you have a government picture ID that had the address on Avenue K? No. And did the account that you had at the bank talk about Avenue K? What do you mean, talk about it? The bank account that you had, Mr. Durst, had no indication that you were living at Avenue K, correct? The teller. No, Mr. Durst, the actual physical bank account did not list, you didn't sign up for that bank account and give your address as Avenue K, correct? Correct. So, Mr. Durst, there was nothing about that bank account that connected you with Avenue K, other than your allegation that the tellers that you dated there knew where you lived. Is that correct? Correct. So would you agree then, Mr. Durst, 
that you were making substantial efforts to try and separate the name Robert Durst from the address Avenue K. Is that correct? I don't know what a substantial effort is. Well, as an example, you weren't using your cell phone in Galveston, correct? Correct. That was because you didn't want it traced, because you understood even back then that if you used your cell phone, they would be able to tell where it was being used, correct? It would be a tell. I was in Galveston. It wouldn't tell where having UK was. So you were so concerned about being located, Mr. Durst, that you didn't want to use your cell phone, period, anywhere in Galveston at all, correct? Correct. And you also paid cash for everything in Galveston instead of credit cards because you didn't want your credit card showing you were in Galveston, is that correct? Correct. But Morris Black knew you were in Galveston, correct? Correct. He knew exactly where you were living, correct? Correct. And he knew that you were running away from the murder and reinvestigation of your wife, correct? I don't have any idea if he knew anything about that. He never said anything to me about that. All right, let's talk about the conversation you had with Susan Berman near the time of her death, where she told you that she had been contacted by New York investigators who wanted to talk to her about Kathy's disappearance. Do you recall that conversation with her? I don't think she said New York investigators. RD 176, 12, 13, 10, page 666, line 12 to page 667, line 5. Let me correct, uh, before you play it, let me correct. You heard from her. Let me stop it for a second. I want to correct myself. I said New York investigators. I meant to say, yes, uh, New York or Los Angeles investigators contacting you about Kathy's disappearance. Does that change your answer? I'm not even sure she said investigators. Okay. She Please might play have clip. said detectives. She might have said reporters. Okay. She might have said investigators. She might have said New York or Los Angeles investigators. She said somebody wanted to talk to her. All right, please play. This is from People's 269, transcript 269A. This is page 90. But you heard from her that she had been contacted by the police? Yes. Yeah. What did she say, if you remember? She said the Los Angeles police contacted me. They want to talk to me about Susie Berman. I think I and you are going to be best off if I just talk to them. She said they want to talk to me about Susie Berman. I'm sorry. Susie Berman said the police are contacting me. Los Angeles police are contacting me. They want to talk to me about your, her Kathy Durst disappearance. Mm -hmm. And this was probably before the PR guy told me that the newspapers are doing these articles. Now, at the time that Susan Berman told you that, you believed it to be true, correct? I believed it was Susan telling me something. I never really... Everything Susan said was kind of a 50-50. It might be true, it might not be true. Mr. Durst, isn't it true that you believed her when she told you that she had been contacted by the police who wanted to talk to her about Kathy's disappearance. Isn't it true that you believed it when she said that? No, I just said I, everything Susan Berman said, you would kind of take with a grain of salt. In fact, Mr. Durst, isn't it true that when I interviewed you on November 15, 2015, that I told you, hey, Bob, Susan lied to you, it wasn't true, and that your response was, I did not know that. Isn't that correct, Mr. Durst? I don't remember, but that would be a right response. Because I never knew when she was lying and when she was not lying. RD 519-31515, page 70, line 22 to page 71. I think it's line 9. March 15th. I'm going to tell you something. 
That wasn't true. They had not contacted her. They were planning to contact her. They had never contacted her. Oh, you know what? That might have come out in a... You knew that before I just said it right now because it came out in the show, right? Has that already come out or no? I can't remember what's out in the show. Did you know what I just told you or no? Is that a new piece? No, I did not know that they had not contacted her. No, they were planning on it. So I'm trying to figure out why would Susan tell you that if it hadn't happened? I mean, any idea? If the detectives had not called her, they had... Mr. Durst, isn't it clear in that interview that you acknowledged that that's the first time you were ever aware that, in fact, what Susan had told you about the police contacting her was not true? When she told me that someone wanted to talk to her, I immediately thought this could be true and this could be not true because this is Susan Berman. Again, Mr. Durst, would you agree? And again, I know that you have said that you deny that Susan called the dean pretending to be Kathy and that you further deny that you killed your wife. So I understand that those two things you're denying, but I want you to assume for a moment that you would agree that if you did kill your wife and if Susan did assist you, that the idea of Susan Berman with her big mouth talking to the police, you would agree that would have represented an existential threat to you, correct? Your witness, Steve Silverman, said that Susan Berman is the last person you would confess a murder to. I agree with that. I never asked Susan Berman to impersonate Kathy Durst, and I did not kill Kathy Durst. So, Mr. Durst, again, let's assume, Mr. Durst, that against Mr. Silverman's advice, and for whatever reason, you did confide in Susan Berman, you did kill your wife. What I'm asking you is, you would agree, Mr. Durst, that if you had done that, and I know you're saying you hadn't, but if you had done that, she would have represented an existential threat in that she was about to talk to the police, correct? You seem to think that all these people are existential threats. Susan Berman, Morris Black. Well, they, well, they both ended up dead, would you agree? I would agree they both ended up dead. <laughs> and would you agree, Mr. Durst, that you brought it up, they were both existential threats. One of them you admit to being involved in the struggle that killed them, and the other one you now admit you found her dead body with the cold breath still breathing on you, correct? When I touched Susan Berman's face, it was cold. Mr. Durst, would you agree that, again, if, in fact, Susan had the information that she had helped you cover up a killing of your wife, that her speaking to the police would have represented an existential threat to you? Would you agree? No. And would you agree, Mr. Durst, that Morris Black, knowing where you were, knowing that he could connect your name to Avenue K, and knowing that you were concerned that you were about to be charged with murder in Galveston, that he represented an existential threat to you? I stayed in Galveston for three weeks, from November 11th to December 4th or 5th. And then on that list that you gave me before, you show the days I was in Galveston. Most of the time, I was not in Galveston, and I was using my correct name and my credit card and my cell phone and writing checks. Mr. Durst, you were very careful not to use anything 
that connected the name Robert Durst to the address on Avenue K. You've already testified to that. Is that correct? Correct. So again, would you agree, Mr. Durst, that both Susan Berman and Morris Black were existential threats to you? No. Would you, uh, would you agree that they both ended up dead in very bizarre incidents? They both ended up dead. Would you agree, Mr. Durst, that you're in the wrong place at the wrong time with respect to both of their deaths? Absolutely. And would you agree, Mr. Durst, that your wife going missing doesn't help your situation? What is my situation? What is your situation? Your situation is, Mr. Durst, you're a man whose wife disappeared, where you are the chief suspect, where Susan Berman is telling numerous people that you killed her and that she helped cover up by calling the dean, where Susan Berman told you she was going to talk to the police, where you have testified that you were aware that she told you that, where she ends up getting murdered with her brains blown out in her house where you find the body, and then you also end up being in Galveston living as a mute woman across the apartment from Morris Black, who's one of the only people in Galveston who knows who you are and can connect you up to that location, and he's allegedly going to end up pulling your own gun with you and being shot, and then you're going to admittedly dismember him and dump the body parts. That's the situation you're Objection. In. Is that a question? Yes. He asked what's... No, no. You, he yeah. asked you a question yeah, yes. and you may not necessarily yeah. answer it. Yeah. That's, yeah. Let me, that is the situation Objection. you are in, Mr. Durst. Would you agree that that is an untenable situation you're in? Objection to the long narrative in front of the question, Your Honor. It's just not proper. Uh, overall. I think you have forgotten that Judge Whitman advised the jurors that the questions are not evidence, that only the answer is evidence. That whole long thing you went through is not supposed to be taken as evidence. Mr. Durst, are you aware that the question is evidence when you figure in your answer to it. So a jury listens to the question, then they listen to your answer, and they evaluate both. Do you understand that? No. All right. I'm going to try one more time, Mr. Durst. Would you agree that whether or not you killed Kathy Durst, murdered Susan Berman, murdered Morris Black, that there are a lot of circumstances that are very difficult for you to explain. It's, it's irrelevant what he thinks, Dick. Would you agree to that? I'm not sure what you're asking me. You're denying that you killed your wife, that you murdered Susan, and that you murdered Morris, correct? Correct. You're aware of all of the evidence that's been put on in this case, correct? I don't know if I'm aware of all of it. I have a working knowledge of most of it. And you're aware that I have been in my questions bringing up various issues in the case, correct? You have been testifying in your questions. Well, Mr. Durst, you've been answering those questions, and those answers to my questions are testimony. Do you understand that? That's an argument. I know, argument. That, I know that my answers are testimony, are evidence. I am under the impression that the jurors are not supposed to view your questions as evidence. The judge will instruct the jury, Mr. Durst. The judge has already explained that when you have a question, the question itself is not evidence. Your answers, which put the questions into perspective and the answers which answer those questions are evidence. But here's my question, you're not answering me. Do you agree that whether that you killed lecture on the law, Your Honor? 
Well, he's uh, the lecturer is actually the the, the wit witness is in, invoking the <clears throat> the law of the pertains to the case as an answer to the question, and the follow-up question is it seems intended to clarify the, the law for the witness. It's really not, it's a dialogue that's uh, understandable, but, uh, but uh, also not uh, useful. They're, they're appropriate questions because they shed light on the, on the witness and his attitude towards testimony, his credibility, et cetera. So I'm allowing the questions in this context, but I would like you to steer this back to the original question and I didn't hear an answer to the original question. So if you'll go back to that rather than this side route. And that's where I just asked again, Mr. Durst, <clears throat> listen to my question. You would agree that whether or not you killed Kathy, whether or not you murdered Susan, whether or not you murdered Morris Black, that there is a lot of evidence in this case that is very difficult for you to account for. That's the final argument. Not, not argument. Object to the question. No, uh, overruled. But uh, I was hoping you were getting more specifically to in this situation, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Lewin. In this specific situation, it presented a, a problem in the context of the right. other. Right. Can yeah. he can you answer that this question, or then I'll yeah. move to the yes. specific. Yes. Can you answer my question, Mr. Durst? I thought I was supposed to wait until the judge finished speaking, and I heard Judge Whitman say he'd like some specifics. It, it's Judge Wyndham. It's not Judge Whitman. Okay, thank you. He's sorry. It's okay. You may uh, you call me anything. <laughs> call me Your Honor, and you're safe. <laughs> His Honor, Your Honor. That'll work. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Durst, please listen to my question. Would you agree that there is substantial evidence involving you being responsible for the death of your wife, the murder of Susan Berman, and the murder of Morris Black, which is difficult for you to explain? I have explained it. So you believe that you've explained that evidence. Is that your testimony? Yeah. All right, let's, uh, let, let's move on. Um, you were concerned about Susan speaking to New York authorities, correct? No. I, I want to go back for a moment. You mentioned, Mr. Durst, um, that in essence that Susan Berman you were aware that she was telling several of her friends including at least two mutual friends of yours Nick Chavin and Julie Baumgold that she was lying to them and telling them that you had killed your wife and that she had called Albert Einstein correct right. and you said that she'd been doing this for years correct Correct. And you said you were not mad at her, correct? Correct. But you did understand that obviously, if that information got back to the authorities, that could result in you being charged with a crime, correct? I don't think so, because I don't think Susan would have sounded credible. I don't think Susan could have impersonated Kathy Durst or any other student at Albert Einstein Medical Center. So Mr. Durst, your position is you had absolutely nothing to fear with respect to Kathy's disappearance, correct? I don't know about nothing to fear. Well, if you weren't afraid of Susan Berman's testimony, what is it that you were afraid of about being linked to your wife's disappearance? I was afraid Janine Pierre always going to use me for her political career. Mr. Durst, but how could she use you? She needs evidence. So what were you worried about that would cause you to hear that she's reopened the investigation 
and to uproot your life to move to Galveston, Texas to live in a $300 a month duppy apartment as a woman. What would cause you to do that if Susan Berman had such little credibility? I don't know what caused me to do it, but I did it. Well, I want you to think about it for a moment. What caused you to uproot your life in that incredibly dramatic way? We'll wait. We'll wait. When I went into hiding in Galveston, I was hoping that nothing would happen. And I was right. Jeanine Pirro did absolutely nothing. And then I left Galveston and went back to my prior life. So, Mr. Durst, your position is that for years, Susan Berman was telling people that you were involved, that you killed your wife and that she covered up for you, correct? Correct. You said she was not credible, so you weren't worried about that at all. Yeah, I don't think people believe Susan Berman because everybody said she used to tell all these stories. So if you weren't afraid of Susan Berman, Mr. Durst, what caused you to uproot your life, to marry your wife, to give her power of attorney, to go on the run living as a mute woman in a dump? What caused you to do that other than being afraid of the information Susan Berman had? I think I would have to rely on the fact that we don't disagree that I did do all those things. And looking back on them, it's stupid and crazy. And if you want me to analyze myself, I can do that. Mr. what I want you to do is, I want you to explain why it was that you would uproot your life in every way when the main evidence of your involvement at the time in your wife's disappearance was Susan Berman and you're saying she's not credible. So if you weren't afraid of Susan Berman, what were you afraid of? Janine Pirro. Janine Pir was Janine Pirro an eyewitness to your case? Janine Pirro was the district attorney of Westchester County. Does Janine Pirro need evidence, Mr. Durst, in order to, to charge you with a crime? I am told that a district attorney, I think the quote I've seen is that any district attorney worth his salt could indict a ham sandwich. Does indicting somebody, Mr. Durst, does that mean that they are found guilty and convicted? That means any DA worth his or her salt could indict a ham sandwich. Means that the thing was. A so, is it your position, Mr. Durst, that tomorrow any DA out there can select anybody and indict them for whatever crime they want? Is that what you're saying? I'm giving you a slogan that I'm sure you have heard before many times. And that slogan, Mr. Durst, you would agree, involves individuals who have committed crimes, and it's the idea that the standard of proof for an indictment is lower than what it takes to convict somebody at a trial, but that you still have to have evidence, correct? I am not a lawyer. What is the evidence that you were afraid of that caused you to, to destroy your life if you were not afraid of what Susan Berman was going to say, what else was there? I only destroyed my life for three weeks, and I kind of enjoyed Galveston. So it's your position, Mr. Durst, that it wasn't a big deal for you to move to Galveston, Texas, live in a $300 a month apartment dressed as a mute woman, that that was some kind of fun vacation for you? No, it was a very, very, very big deal. I was going bananas, and I did all those things. So, Mr. Durst, I'm going to take one more try at it. Are you aware, what other evidence were you concerned about, other than Susan Berman, 
that would have caused you to flee your comfortable life in New York and move to Galveston? What evidence? <laughs> Ask and answer. A rule. Repetitious. A rule. Well, you brought forth all kinds of evidence. The fact that I lied to Mike Stroke twice. The fact that I had no evidence, no way to prove that Kathy had gotten on the train, that I had no way to prove that Kathy had gotten back to the Riverside Drive apartment with all my word. So what you're saying is, Mr. Durst, is you were aware that there was evidence independent of Susan Berman that demonstrated that you murdered your wife and you were worried about that evidence, correct? Correct. Now, Mr. Durst, can you explain why, if Susan Berman for years was telling your mutual friends that you were a murderer, why you continued to give her money? Can you explain that? You're asking me. I knew she was saying those things and I did give her money. Mr. Durst, exactly. Does that sound reasonable? Well, I did it. It's either reasonable or unreasonable, but it's factual that I did do it. So, Mr. Durst, no one's disputing that you gave Susan Berman money. Do you understand that? The issue we're discussing right now get is... an answer to your question. It's not, re it's not really a question unless you get an answer, even as a preface to another question. You just asked a question, and then you continue to ask another question. Get your answer, and then move to the next question. Okay, Mr. Durst, you would agree that nobody is disputing that you gave Susan the money. Would you agree? I am in a... Yes, I would agree that no one is disputing that I gave Susan Berman money. Would you agree that the issue is not whether you gave her money, it's why you gave her money. Would you agree? No. I don't even think it's an issue. I gave her money because I felt like giving her money. You felt like giving somebody a total of $275,000 who for years was telling your mutual friends falsely that you had murdered your wife and she had helped you cover it up. Is that your testimony to this jury today? I started giving Susan Berman money before Kathy disappeared. Well, Mr. Durst, we know that you gave her $50,000 by your own admission the last month of her life, basically, correct? Correct. And by that time, Mr. Durst, you were well aware for years that she had been telling people you say falsely that you murdered your wife and that she helped you cover it up, correct? Correct. Why would you give somebody money who was out there saying that you had murdered your wife? I feel like I'm being asked to analyze myself. I did what I did because I did what I did because I am who I am. I said before that people tell me I'm on the autistic spectrum. That's why, but that's what I did. Wait, wait, so you're, you're gonna, you're telling this jury that you gave Susan Berman 50 grand in basically the last month of her life after you were aware that she was falsely telling people you murdered your wife and she helped cover it up because you're on the spectrum? Is that truly your testimony? No, I'm using that as an example. I gave her a lot more than $50,000 subsequent to Kathy's disappearance and subsequent to my finding out that Susan was saying that it was Susan who called Albert Einstein, not Kathy. So, Mr. Durst, the question is still, would you agree? You're saying, I did what I did, but would you agree that for somebody looking at it, that it doesn't make sense why you would give somebody 
who was falsely accusing you of murdering your wife a bunch of money. Would you agree that that is pretty unexplainable? I can't explain my actions. Okay, so you can't explain your actions, so I understand. The next question I'm asking you, would you agree that somebody looking at your actions and trying to make sense of them, that it would be difficult to understand how somebody would give another person large amounts of money who was falsely spreading stories that they had murdered their wife when the person giving the money was aware that the person was falsely spreading stories. Can you explain that? I was giving Susan Berman lots of money long before the last month of her life. Okay, listen to my question. I'm not asking you about what you gave her before. Listen to the question. You said for five years you were aware that Susan Berman was making up a lie to your mutual friends that you had murdered your wife and that she had covered it up by calling Albert Einstein, correct? I estimated five years, correct. And you mentioned three people. You mentioned Nick Chavin, you mentioned Julia Bongo, and you mentioned Ainsley Pryor, correct? Correct. And you knew about this. You knew that that was a lie you're saying, correct? I knew that that was a what? You knew that was a lie, you're saying. You didn't do that. Susan is lying by telling them that you, that you have commit, uh, confessed murder to her and that she helped you cover it up, right? Correct. And yet, you are testifying that even after knowing that, you continued to give her large amounts of money, correct? Correct. And you've said, I can't explain why I did it, correct? Correct. And you've also said, well, I'm autistic, correct? Correct. And I simply asked you, would you agree that for people looking at the situation, not only can't you explain it, but that it's hard to come up with a reasonable explanation why somebody would continue to give money to somebody who is falsely accusing them of murder. Would you agree? I'm, I don't... No, I would not agree. Tell me why you would not agree. Because I don't know how people... So, Mr. Durst, you're telling me you don't know how people act. Would you agree, Mr. Durst, that rational people do not give money to individuals who are falsely accusing them of committing murder? Would you agree to that? She was falsely accusing me of committing murder. But I felt that in most cases, nobody would believe her because she was a known storyteller. Right, although at the same time you're saying no one would believe her, as soon as you find out that they're reinvestigating, you take off for Galveston, Texas to go live as a mute woman in a $300 a month dump apartment, correct? I don't think the things have anything to do with one another. Wait, you, wait, you think that you're taken off to Galveston to live as a mute woman in the $300 dump apartment did not have anything to do with the fact that you were afraid that you were about to be charged with your wife's disappearance. No, well, that's exactly why I went to Galveston, because I was afraid I was going to be indicted for Kathy Durst's death. Would you agree, Mr. Durst, Let's change one thing about the questions I've been asking you, where you say you cannot come up with a reason, you can't explain it. I want to change one thing. Would you agree, Mr. Durst, that if in fact Susan Berman had made that call and had helped you cover up the murder, that it would make sense while you, while you were giving her a bunch of money? Would you agree? I know you're saying it didn't happen. Would you agree if that were true? that it would make sense for you to be giving her money. But it was not true, and it would not make sense 
for me to have gone to Susan Berman and asked her to call the medical center and pretend that she was Kathy because I would have known that Susan Berman would not have been able to impersonate a student at Albert Einstein. Mr. Durst, you've said before that you lie a lot, was a quote from you, but that doesn't mean you're a good liar. You indicated you said that, correct? Correct. Mr. Durst, would you agree that just because you kill a lot doesn't mean you're good at it? I think there's going to be an objection. What's that? Overruled. I don't kill a lot. Well, you, you killed Morris Black, correct? Morris Black died accidentally while I was defending myself. Right, and you've now said, by the way, that the reason that one of them that you would not have gone to Susan Berman is Susan Berman would not have been a good person to go to for help based on the fact that she had a big mouth, correct? Well, based on a lot of things, the fact that she had a big mouth was part of it. And, but you agree, Mr. Durst, that in covering up Morris Black's disappearance, that you made enough mistakes for about 10 different killings, correct? You made mistake after mistake after mistake, correct? Not correct, and Morris Black did not disappear. Well, Mr. Durst, first of all, correct me if I'm wrong, you dismembered his body in your apartment and left evidence in the apartment, correct? Correct. You left the gun that you killed him with in the trash can, correct? I left the gun that he died with in the crash, in the trash can. A gun that was registered to you, correct? Correct. You cut up his body parts and put it in bags, correct? Correct. You dump them in a bay where the water doesn't move and where the bags didn't go out to sea, correct? Correct. You put them, the body parts, in a bag that had a newspaper with your address on it, correct? Correct. Do you want me to keep going, or will you concede that you made a whole lot of mistakes with Morris Black? I made a whole lot of mistakes with Morris Black. So, would you agree, Mr. Durst, that just because maybe telling Susan Berman wasn't a good idea doesn't mean that's not exactly what you did? Telling Susan Berman that I had committed a murder, I will accept what Steve Silverman said, that she is the last person you would tell that you committed a murder. Would you agree, Mr. Durst, she'd be the last person you would tell unless she was the last person that you could get help from? Would you agree, Mr. Durst, that if you killed your wife, that you needed a woman to call in to the medical school to pretend to be Kathy. It needed to be a woman, correct? No. So you're saying that you could have had a man call up pretending to be Kathy. Is that correct? I did not kill my wife, so I did not need a woman to call Albert Einstein. Okay, let's do it this way. I want you to assume for a moment, Mr. Durst, that in fact, you had killed your wife and Mr. Durst, that you needed somebody to make that call to Albert Einstein. You would agree that Susan Berman, given your relationship, is probably the only person you know who would have ever agreed to make that call, correct? Do you agree, Mr. Durst, that given your relationship with Susan Berman, that if you would have asked her to make the call to Albert Einstein, you cannot say that she would have said no, correct? I cannot say okay. that, she, that she would have said no. It's a double negative. 
I had said before that I wasn't sure if she would have made the call or not. I also said that what was relevant was the fact that she could not have gotten away with impersonating a student at Albert Einstein. Mr. Durst, so you agree then that if you had asked Susan Berman to make that call, you're not testifying, oh no, Susan absolutely would have said, I will never make that call. Your response is, I don't know. Maybe she would have made the call, maybe not, correct? Correct. Do you know any other woman in your life that you could say that about, that you could have called up and said, I need you to call Albert Einstein pretending to be Kathy? Can you name me one other woman you know that would have done it? Speculation. Overruled. Well, what I'm thinking about is Susie Giordano. Well, you didn't know Susie Giordano then, though, did you? I did know her. In 1982? Yes. How old was Susie Giordano in 1982, Mr. Durst? I guess she was pretty young. <laughs> You're going to take her out of middle school and ask her to make the call? Yeah. Is that a serious answer yeah. on your part? Uh, intentionally a, a question take her what? out of middle middle school I think she testified she was eight, 18 but you you uh, you you it's not an appropriate question you, take her out of middle school you're being what? facetious and that that's not appropriate mr. Durst you would agree that Susie Giordano was not an adult in 1982 correct yeah I would agree so you got to knock her off the list correct Yeah, I would take her off the list. So, is there one no, uh, woman? Not, not oh, yet. I'm going Do you have an objection now? Yes. Then. What's the objection? Tempting. Speculation, Your Honor. Overruled. I'd like to explain it aside. Okay. Please. Okay. Mr. Durst, can you name one oh, woman? I'm working on it. Okay. I'll wait. <laughs> Go ahead. Let's take our break. It's 3.05. We'll come back at 3.20. Ladies and gentlemen, you know the routine. Don't converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected with this case. Do not form or express any opinion on the case. He's asking him to pick out somebody that he would use for an alibi. Your Honor, it's, it's unfathomable. Who would you have drive the getaway car if you were going to rob a bank? Who would you have help you kill somebody? Well, it's completely speculative, Your Honor. That's not cross-examination. Mr. Lewin? So, first of all, Mr. Durst has conceded on his own that he cannot say, even if you believe him, that he cannot say that Susan Berman would have turned him down in that request. Other witnesses have said, almost uniformly, that they believe that if he would have asked, she would have done it. He brought this up by saying repeatedly, I would never have told Susan Berman that because Susan Berman had a big mouth. And the point that I'm making is, sometimes you don't get to pick the person that you want to use to cover up your crime, you pick the person that's willing to do it. This is an extremely relevant area, and he is demonstrating by the fact that his response is to choose somebody who I believe was likely in middle school at the time that, that he stated that, 
as someone that he would talk to, there isn't anybody. Okay, Your Honor, in response yes. to that, he asked him to pick somebody that he would use for an alibi. He picked somebody that he's been attacking as his personal best friend. I don't think he meant he picked him because Susie Giordano was available. That's the whole point of this. He's asking him to pick names out of a hat of people that I guess you would trust. But when you look at the fact that Dr. Cooperman said it was not, uh, it was uh, Kathy that called. When you look at the fact that for 30 years he said it was uh, uh, Susan that called. I mean, I'm sorry, Kathy that called. I mean. When, when does it end, Your Honor? He keeps making hypotheticals, but I'm going to ask you, Your Honor, would it be okay for him to ask, who would you have drive the getaway car? I mean, if there were evidence that someone drove a getaway car, <coughs> there's no there's no evidence there's no evidence, Your Honor, that uh, Susan Berman called the school. It's merely a theory. There's not a single person who can attest to the fact that the call actually occurred. I think there's overwhelming evidence that Susan Berman uh, made made the call, and that me? there's overwhelming evidence that Susan Berman did make the call. The question here is, is the implication is that no one else would have done it. There is no one else, and so the the, the what the people are the people are entitled to present their theory. If, if there's any evidence to support it and confront the defendant with that, they have a good faith basis for asking questions uh, such as this. So, so it's, it's overwhelming so, evidence. Don't that argue it, with me. Uh, yes, yes. No, I, I think well, it, I think that it a is. congenital liar told people she made the call. Ye yes, Mr. Chesnoff. I, I think you need to be able to see their case. You don't have to accept it, but you have to see it in order to in order to argue this right. I mean, there there is. There are multiple witnesses who have testified to this fact and 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 uh, facts that are consistent with this fact, and so it's it's not a whole cloth. I mean, this this is this is uh, there's an evidentiary basis for the question. So the question is: It's speculative. Who else would you have chosen? In, in a sense, I, I, it's speculative because there's no one else. But. Uh, I suppose you could confine Mr. Lewin to asking uh, maybe 15 questions. I mean, the element of uh, what, are, what is each element? You, you killed her, didn't you? You lied about it, didn't you? Uh, you, you the reason you did it is, but, but that, there's no art there. I mean, there's no, it's not, it's not necessary to constrain uh, the, 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 the people. It's, it's gone longer than I want, but it, it's, you know, I think it's appropriate. Yes, Mr. Wait, Mr. McGarren wants to, yes. May, may I ask, please? You're yes. Right. You're allowing Mr. Lewin to use hypothetical questions in which the premise is something that is absolutely unacceptable to Mr. Durst as a witness. It's absolutely unacceptable for him to assume that he's guilty. It's unacceptable for him to assume that uh, something happened that, that he absolutely says did not happen. And you have to, I, I don't understand how you can allow someone to ask a hypothetical question like that. So but it is Assuming interesting. Assuming you killed John F. Kennedy, would you do that? Would you say that? Would you, uh, well, I mean, deputy, you could ask, uh, you could, uh, you could uh, certainly ask the, the accused killer that question. So anyway, the, the point here, no, but there is an interesting question that Mr. DeGuerin raises, and, and I have never seen this before, but I think conceptually it is, it's very interesting. So these are, lay, uh, hypotheticals are given to support opinions, and these are lay opinions, and typically you call your own witness, and you ask the witness their opinion, and, and it's all friendly. Here you're compelling an opinion, but why not? I can't see any basis not to compel an opinion. Question here, though, when a witness denies the premise, is it appropriate, nonetheless, to assume the premise and, yes. and, and compel the opinion? Yes, and, and let me, first of all, let me just address a couple of things that Mr. DeGarren started with, and I'll go yeah. in reverse order. Number one, if the court recalls, on direct, Mr. DeGarren did not have to ask the question. He asked Bob Durst, did you murder Susan Berman? That was done. It's a technique that defense attorneys use. Look at the jury, no, I didn't murder her. 
it is absolutely appropriate then for me to ask him, hey, if you did murder her, what'd you tell us? What was the response? No. They went where they wanted to go. Um, in my opinion, considering that in the interview that I did with Mr. Durst, Mr. Durst had already said that he would lie about it. It wasn't a question I would have asked. But that's not that's not but, an issue. That was a that was a good question. And and but here's that here. No, well, that's, that's hypothetical. It is hypothetical. It, 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 I'm addressing what he's saying. Which, by the way, it's interesting. I get it's not the court. I get tired of people saying, "Well, you can't do that because well, that's not what's normally done." I've spent my career doing things that aren't normally done. No, I mean the question. The question is, Mr. Lewin, and you are very creative. But I mean, the, the question is here: um, is is there a valid objection to the to the question? And so, well, it depends. So, Your Honor, that's why I started with. So, as an example, when Mr. DeGaren asked Bob Durst, he says, "Did you kill Susan?" No. So now that puts me in a position where I need to get Mr. Durst to admit that, listen, even though I've answered, no, I didn't kill her, I wouldn't tell you even if I did. That brings in his history admitted of committing perjury. This goes directly to his credibility. Now, here's what's interesting. He had no problem answering any of my hypotheticals until we had a break, and he said it on the witness stand, and his attorneys basically told him, don't answer that. Now, that's not me speculating. That's what he answered um, at one point in time. However, then he slips up and periodically he answers one. So here's the bottom line. They have not given one case. They've not given one evidentiary uh, code, not one indication as to what I'm doing, how it is improper. So back to the court's point. So if he says, I didn't do it, the reason why that's relevant is because you want to be asking, and again, I'll go to the latest thing of where I went. So Mr. Durst, would you agree, you're saying that you did not kill Susan, you didn't kill Kathy, you didn't kill Morris. You're also saying, though, that you gave Susan a bunch of money. Can you explain it? He says, no, I, I can't explain it, etc. I try, I have Asperger. So the next thing, which I have a right to say is, well, would you agree, Mr. Durst, that if you did kill, or if somebody did kill somebody and was giving them money, that that would certainly be an indication that a juror could look at and say, you know what, that is certainly incriminating. That's been the history of how I have done my question. So they might not like that Mr. Durst, let's face it, Your Honor, jury's not here. He's committed more perjury than I've ever seen in my life. I, I believe the court would say he's never seen this amount of perjury. There's so much perjury that when I'm impeaching him about perjury, he commits more perjury. I, I almost can't even keep track of all the perjury. I have to have the other four lawyers fact-checking in real time so that they can uncover an area of perjury that I might have missed. Here's my concern. I don't want to see a geometric progression of no. your of your cross examination it, 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 because that's that's the logical uh, result. No, it's, no, but but I'm I'm working through it, Your Honor, and I would just let the court know if you look, we are a getting, little bit of impeachment goes a long well, well, way. The jurors will be instructed well, that if a witness well, lies about a material part well, of his testimony, he should be tr distrusted in all, and it all can be disregarded. Your Honor, just to indicate what we've gotten today, just since lunchtime, Mr. Durst has said things that are incredibly damaging. We have not had a day, Your Honor. Uh, again, I've done this almost 30 years. No, no, you're, you're, that, that, so the only point right now, and, and, uh, and I thank you for explaining yourself, the sure. question is whether the objection that this is speculative, that if, if, uh, if she didn't, if you wanted someone to make a call for you who sounded like a woman and it weren't Susan Berman, who would it be? And he's going through his list of so, friends. So well, the, the, logic, the logical answer is no one. No but, let, no, but let me answer that. Here's the problem. He's the one who brought this up. Remember how this came up. Bob Durr said. Your Honor, can I interrupt it, for one second? It, it, if you're no. overruling us, why are we listening to this? Uh, it's interesting. Well, no it, go ahead. In, in response, Bob Durr says on his own, I would never have told Susan, no one would tell Susan this, listen to what Steve Silverman said. So he's basically saying, you should believe that I would never have told Susan Berman this because, in essence, it's a dumb thing to do. So what did I do? The first thing I did is I went back to Galveston and I demonstrated, I think, pretty effectively, hey, listen, 
no one said that you commit these crimes intelligently. You made all kinds of mistakes in Galveston. First he said he didn't, then he has to admit it. Then I come back and I say, well, wait a minute. You would agree that you are limited by who you ask in terms of who's available and who's willing to do it. Then I ask him, you agree that you've said that Susan Berman, you cannot state that she wouldn't have done this. He agrees. So I ask him, OK, name me one other person that you could have gone to. That is not a hypothetical that calls for speculation. That is basically saying, who do you know back then in 1982 that you think you could have gone to to cover up a murder? I overrule the objection. Okay. Something else, Mr. Intergarren? Yes. He has not addressed the, the undeniable fact that in order to answer the question, he asks that Mr. Durst first assume is true something that Mr. Durst cannot assume is true because Mr. Durst says it's not true. I cannot assume that I killed my wife. I right. cannot assume that I killed Susan That's his Burr. answer, and then he's uh, refusing to uh, answer the question, I suppose, but um, but he can, I guess he could, that could be his answer. That's not been his answer, but I, 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 I don't, I don't ha hear the authority that a person may not be probed on something they deny, particularly when there's that evidence that supports the idea that, uh, that, has, that is the subject of the question. But I don't hear an authority from Mr. Lewin, who, seems, who says that he knows all the law, that it's permissible all to that force a witness to accept a false premise. That which is not forbidden is permissible. So, all right, recess. Thank you.